Hey everybody, welcome to A Voice in the Wilderness podcast. Today, man, I've got a young man with me, a young man that loves the Lord, and uh, man, I just absolutely love this guy's energy and his spirit. Uh, my brother is a is a youth pastor yes, at sir. Connect Church in Lake City, Florida, and we're going to be talking. I wanted to bring somebody in that was younger because, it, you know, as a guy that works with people, mm-hmm. and I work with all kind of like different people, age groups, marriages, kids, high school kids, junior high kids. And, you know, this generation that you're in, um, Sam, is just, it just, it's, it's so unique. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, I, I really want to pick your brain about it because I, I, I mean, essentially on this podcast, I want to grow and learn yep. about how is it that we reach your generation? You know what I'm saying? But before we get into all that, man, let everybody, uh, if you would, let everybody know who you are. Okay. A little bit about you and how you wound up in Lake City and how you wound up at Connect Church and, and, I got what, you. and what's going on. Yes, sir. So um, it, it's actually a pretty, pretty funny story. Um, my uh, lead pastor now, Pastor Ray Keen, uh, used to be my youth pastor in a place called Lateral, Florida. And uh, I started going to youth group when I was in sixth grade and, you know, from sixth grade to uh, 11th grade, I just loved ministry. I always wanted to do ministry. You know, Pastor Ray made it look really cool. And I was like, you know what? And then once, you know, God came into my life, he confirmed I was supposed to be a children's pastor, a youth pastor, and then in the end goal, be a lead pastor. And so I already had my whole kind of ministry uh, planned out. And the, the question then was, how does this happen? And so in 11th grade, uh, going into 12th grade, our children's pastor at the church ended up transitioning away, and I was the default. So they said, you know what, Samuel, we want you to step up, and you got this. And so I was that children's pastor for a year, and then Pastor Ray reached out from Lake City and said, hey, you know, God laid on my heart. I really feel like, uh, you know, you would really thrive here in Lake City. I want to bring you on board my team. And I just knew in my spirit, I was like, you know, there, this is a time of transition. God's wanting new things. And uh, I kind of came up here with a full-time job at Tractor Supply, and I just gave it to God. I said, God, you know, I believe this is what you want me to do. And so thankfully, I was able to be a part of, uh, you know, Connect Church. And I've been um, part of the ministry now almost two and a half years once one and a half year as a children's pastor and then at uh march of last year is when our youth pastor transitioned and they actually were gave me the op- uh the position to step into the youth pastor with the contingencies being you have to be the children's pastor and the youth pastor because right. we just i mean especially right before covid hit we just didn't have anybody else and so it was definitely um it was definitely a balancing act trying to figure out, okay, how do I reach ages four through 18 (laughs) in the same, you know, week? Like, how is this going to happen? And so I, you know, I finally got the balance of things after trial and error, a lot of lessons learned. And uh, thankfully back in uh, January, our previous children's pastor, Pastor Chris Stitzinger stepped back into that position and I was able to focus solely on what my heart's desire was. And that was for youth. And so um, that's about my ministry story. As as far as personal story, uh, I am adopted. I was adopted at two days old by my parents. Uh, and um, God took me from what could have been a drug ridden family. And my parents adopted me out of a whole mess. And they kept me super uh, protected from that environment from, um, you know, the generational curses on my, my blood family. Um, because my blood would say I was supposed to be an alcoholic or a drug addict and, you know, somebody who would leave their kids and, you know, a bunch of other things. But my parents really gave me um, a, a great lifestyle. And, you know, they, they showed me who Jesus was. And, you know, before I ever met Jesus, they were Jesus to me. And then I finally met Jesus when I was ninth grade at church. And, you know, here I am today because I just, you know, had a heart for ministry and I didn't want to wait because that's what everybody told me to do. Well, you have to wait till you're about 24, 25, graduate Bible college, then you can start. And I just I felt like that wasn't, you know, the plan. I felt like God wanted me to do what he laid on my heart to do now, not to wait for later. And so. Well, I tell you, man, um, I've I've not been to seminary Mm. and, you know, honestly, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people talk about they refer to seminary as cemetery because it like kills your faith or something. Right, right. I don't know. I've never been. I can't, I can't, you yeah. know, I can't, I can't uh, speak for that. But I, I can tell you that um, if, cemetery, if, if cemetery or seminary or whatever you call it, 
if that is a requirement to be a man of God, then all the apostles that started this whole thing out are disqualified. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I love these churches that go, Hey, you know, uh, we can't hire you unless you have a master's degree. And I'm like, well, Jesus didn't qualify for your church, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> I'm just saying, yep. well, he's the son of God. Well, what about the apostles? What about Peter? What about mm-hmm. John? What about Luke? What about, you know, what about these other guys? I mean, and you know, I had somebody ask me one time I was fixing a, I was being interviewed for, a position at a church as a senior pastor and they were doing a Q and a with me in the sanctuary. And this guy said, um, have you been ordained? And he asked me that. And I said, no. And he goes, really? I don't think I want a pastor that's not ordained. And I said, well, don't vote for me. I said, because they asked me to ordain, you know, they wanted to do an ordination ceremony for me. I said, but I told them that when I was born, God ordained me to be a pastor. Mm, amen. I don't need nobody. I don't need a man to tell me I, mm-hmm. I, I'm called into ministry. And, you know, I, I'm just one of those people that when I, when I think about the call that God has on a man's life or a woman's life, you know what? You don't need nobody to confirm that to you. Exactly. I don't need nobody to tell me I'm, you know, don't, I, not that I'm, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to nobody, mm-hmm. but God is the one that calls us. Yep. You know, he's the one that created us and knit us together in our womb and chose where we're going to live and who we're going to be around. And, and, you know, and I can just tell you, man, that <clears throat> I've been around, I've been born again since 2008 mm-hmm. and I've been around a lot of guys, man. But I'm going to tell you, man, when I get around you, you are like, you, I mean, it is like somebody is prodding me with like something electric because man, you have just got such a, 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 a zeal Appreciate it. F- for your faith, man. At your age, it's incredible to me. And you don't see that in this generation that you're in. You just, I mean, we are, we are literally as a, as, as a body of believers, Mm -hmm. we are failing your generation in a miserable way right now. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about that while we're on the show, but you know, I just want to compliment you and tell you, man, that I I love watching you minister. I Mm -hmm. love watching you pastor. I love your videos. I love the things that you're doing. I love how you uh, are excited and how people come on, on, on board with you and come along and team up with you. And I love what you're doing, man, and that's why I want to tie you in with FCA because I know that you, I know that when you get a little taste of what it's like to go into a school mm-hmm. and minister to a lot of these kids that have never been churched before, that don't even know, you know, the Book of John is the Book of John. Exactly. And when you start talking to these kids about uh, Christ and grace and mercy and there's a better way, and man, it's just like it's the most rewarding thing to watch people who have never heard. Mm-hmm about the truth and the grace and the mercy of Christ, man, it's just, to me, it's like one of the, I tell people, I've tried everything the world has to offer when yep. it comes to, you know, the living the wild lifestyle. I've tried all that. There's nothing that compares to me when I see someone surrender their heart to the Lord, whether it be a teenager, mm-hmm. whether it be a grown man, whether it be a, a woman, um, or, or see God heal people. Yep. I mean, there's just... When you when you do what we do, mm-hmm. and I don't I can't speak for you, but when you do what we do, yeah, my my <laughs> my victory, my touchdown, my home run, my whatever is somebody getting a taste of what I've experienced in my life through my walk, of course, and and with Jesus, and I want to see somebody else taste that that relationship with Christ like I've had a chance to, and and I tell people, you know, a lot of people have these. You know, they have these discussions about once saved, always saved and all that. And I I tell people all the time, I'm like, I'm not sure it's, you know, that that's the issue. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm not sure that it's, you know, people losing their salvation. I'm not so, I'm not convinced that that's it. I'm convinced that a lot of people have never truly surrendered their heart to the Lord because once you taste of it, once you experience God using you in somebody's life and once you see how he will create such great things in your marriage and your relationships and your family. Mm-hmm. And once you see him just turn all those, you know, those, those, those curses that you were talking about, those family yeah, curses, that curses. They, once you see those broken and yep. you experience all that kind of stuff, man, you're just like, how could I turn back? Yes. yes. I, I don't know how, you know, so for me, I think it's not necessarily a question of once saved, always saved. Mm-hmm. I've always said, it's a question of whether it was one they were once saved. Yes, yes. That's you know, good. because you know a tree by your by, the, by its fruit. I mm-hmm. mean, and I tell people, I'm not judging nobody. Of course. But I can watch how you act for about 10 minutes, and mm-hmm. I can tell you where you're at in your faith. Yep. You know, and that's not condemning nobody. Of course. I'm just saying, you know, I had a guy tell me yesterday, he said, 
or actually it was this morning we were working out one of my one of my workout partners he said he said you know sometimes i'm a little concerned about um i think i don't remember exactly how he said it but he said you know if i die am i going to go to heaven and i said dude i'm totally convinced mm-hmm. i mean i'm yeah, like exactly i'm like totally convinced like yep. like if god takes me home and you guys come to my funeral you can play this at my funeral you can put it on the screen don't cry for this guy yeah because i'm gonna tell you while you're sitting there crying i'm gonna be checking it out i'm gonna be like peter you gotta <laughs> talk to me about this walking on water thing yes and paul you gotta explain to me how it is that you went from being a murderer to preaching the gospel in less than two weeks. You got to explain this to me, man. Exactly. You got to share this thing. Jonah, explain to me what it's like to be in the belly of a whale. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm going to be busy. I got, I got questions. <laughs> I, got, I love you. I, I don't, I, I don't want to leave you here. Yep. You know what? But I'm going to tell you something. When I get up there, I remember when, when pastor Joe, mm-hmm. that was the pastor of the school my kids were going to, he passed away and they called like a, a little get together with all the students and they were all sitting in the chapel and, a lot of them were crying, mm-hmm. and and, and I, it was just, and, and and the pastor of the school, Pastor Pete, he said, "Hey man, he said, um, won't you pray for us, Skipper? Pray for us." And I started praying, and I got about you know four or five words into it. And I'm like, "Why are we sad? This man lived his entire life to do the gospel, preach the gospel, to share the gospel, mm-hmm. and now he's in the presence of everybody that he's always talked to everybody in the world about." Yep. He is in the best place he'll ever be in his entire existence. Why are we crying? Exactly. You know, and it just, when you start switching that, the way that you perceive things in your mind, Mm -hmm. when it comes to your faith, it just changes everything. So with all that, I know I've just ran down five different trails. I apologize. (laughs) But I I need to know this from you, man. How old are you now? I'm 21. 21. So you're legally... Like, you get in trouble, you go in the newspaper. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so they can print your name. That's kind of the way I always look at it. That's what my mom and dad said, too. So you're right, right there with them. <laughs> so, man, tell me um, why you think that we are, are just failing your generation so miserably in the church. And why is it that so many people, I guess you're in Generation Z or whatever. What do they call you? So I would actually still be a millennial. Um, Generation Z, I think I miss it by like one or two years. Um, but I mean, I spend enough time around these kids where I kind of feel like, you know, I, yeah. Gen Z almost, you know, pouring out. Um, you know, I, I think the biggest, the biggest problem is, and, and I, I've talked to a lot of kids and the biggest thing is pressure. There's so much pressure to be something that they're not, you know, we, we expect them to be perfect. We expect them to do things that just they're not ready for that society actually tells them to do the opposite of, you know, you know, it, it, if everything that you're supposed to do that was bad was cool back then. Now it's even cooler because it's all streamed on the internet and it's praised and it's promoted. And the biggest thing is these students, they don't need somebody uh, who's getting onto them. They need somebody to be able to stand alongside of them and guide them and to lead them. Um, you know, like Jesus leading the disciples, even though in the end they weren't going to do the right thing. They weren't going to stand there next to Jesus and say, okay, no, they all fled. Jesus knew that, but he still walked with them. And because of that, they were able to continue to be the apostles. And I think that that's the same thing with that we need to do with these students in this age. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to mess up. They're going to, um, you know, out of two things, choose the latter that may be bad, but we need to be there to say, okay, how did that feel? It didn't work out. You need to try this. Come alongside of me. Let's do this. I'm not mad at you. And that's the biggest thing. I get messages from students. Are you mad at me? No, I'm not mad at you. (laughs) I said, I'm not mad at you. I said, Jesus, what did he say to the disciples who literally deserted him? No, he showed them the scars. You know, he appeared to them before he went up. He made it his mission to. And so I think pressure has a lot to do with it. You know, me and Crystal are going to be taking over the camp we were talking about this when you first came yep. in today um, down in old town uh, was known as camp Anderson. We're probably going to be changing the name and mm-hmm. um, you know, stuff like that. So, but, but man, I'm so excited about that Yes, <laughs> because what I find when I take these kids and I implement this whole outdoor ministry and I put them around a fire and mm-hmm. I get them out there and the owls are hooting and the sun, I mean the, the, the moon's, shining bright and the stars are beautiful because there's no you know there's no artificial light to mess it up and, mm-hmm. and you just get them out there man and you start talking to these young guys i remember we did i do a thing called campfire confession 
And I had 17 guys sitting around that fire. And within a 30-minute period um, of us st- sitting down, all 17 were repenting for pornography addiction. Wow. And I'm like, dude. I said, thank you, Jesus, that you got me here in this place because yes. that doesn't happen in a church. Exactly. Exactly. You're not, you're not going to get a teenage boy to walk up to the altar and say, I'm struggling with porn. Mm. I can't do this. And, you know, when you get out of that environment and one of them steps up and says, man, I'm struggling. Yep. And then the other one says, you know what? I am too, man. And all of a sudden there's a brotherhood that comes about because I don't know how many of you have. I don't know if you've ever watched this, but Ted Bundy, the, the serial killer. Yep. Yep. His last interview, they put it on Netflix last year, and I watched it, and I remember there was just one part of it that just really like jumped out at me. Mm-hmm. And at the end of it, he said, I've never met a violent offender in prison, and I've met many, 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 and I've never met one that did not have a major porn addiction wow. prior to committing the crimes. And I thought, you know, we underestimate – you know, it seems so innocent when mm-hmm. you're, when you're, when you're, I mean, it doesn't really seem innocent because you hide it and that tells you everything, Yeah. but it seems so harmless because it's just you yeah. and, and, and the internet. But the reality is, man, is that it's creating an in, inward, an inward wound. Yeah. It's iniquity, it's sin, that's iniquity. And I tell people it commit, it, it, it it's an inward wound that it, 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 it enables young men to have the ability to have intimacy yep. in any form of their life with Christ, with another person. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why you see so much going on in these relationships. So many people getting divorced and so many people yes. not staying together and, and not being treated correctly and women being treated like objects because pornography makes you think that a female is something to satisfy you exactly instead of a human being that God loves and wants you to protect and, mm-hmm. and cherish. And so, um, how much do you think, man, like when you think about this generation that you're ministering to and your generation, how much, because we didn't grow up with cell phones. I didn't. Of course. How no. much do you think, and how do you think that's affecting the, the uh, our ability to reach them? I, I honestly think it, it's definitely prohibiting it um, because, I mean, even conversations with my dad, my dad said, you know, if, if I wanted to view that type of stuff, I had to get a magazine mm-hmm. or something, you know, and it was hard. It was hard to get it. And, and nowadays, I mean, literally within four seconds, we could have access to it. And, and I think that's why it's important to, you know, to put blockage, to put, uh, you know, safe places, uh, or safe, um, apps, you know, on phones and whatnot, but you got to get to the root of the issue. You've got to get to like why, and you have to teach, you know, why this is wrong and not even, um, just showing, you know, living by example. I, one of my students the other day, it's funny that you bring that up. I was talking to him and, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, ask about it or anything. He just flat out told me, he said, Hey, you know, I did this yesterday. And I was just like, okay, okay. You did, you know, what do you, you know, why, you know, you get down to the basic questions. You know, I never even told him it was wrong. I was going to save that conversation for later. We were in the middle of doing to go do something, but I just had a conversation with him and I just, I told him my testimony about it. I told him why, you know, why we choose not to and why I choose not to because of, uh, you know, it presenting this false image of what women are. And, um, also just things that could lead down the road. Like if, if they ever wanted to try to, you know, marry a woman that's going to be an issue that they need to address now and i said it's going to be a lot easier to address it now at 13 years old than to address it later when you're 30 years old and you have kids it's going to mess up a whole lot more than just your mom and dad it's going to be a whole thing and so you know six months later you know i didn't even think about it uh six months later forgot to have that conversation but i prayed for him i was like god you know you just heal them, do whatever you need to do. And, and I let that be it. Six months later, we were in the car again. We were going somewhere and he just told me, he goes, Hey, Pastor Samuel, I just want to let you know it's been six months since I watched it. And yeah. I was like, what? He goes, well, that conversation we had, you know, I just, and I never told him not to do it. He knew right. not to do it. He didn't need a, a lecture. He needed an example to say, okay, this is how not to do it. I gave him practical steps. I said, it's, it's okay to have blocks on your phone. You know, it's okay to, have your search history to where people, I said, I'm here, you know, I'm never going to judge you. If you mess up, you just, you know, whatever. And, you know, just to see that change. And so I think it's not always just trying to shove the answer in their face, but rather, you know, be that an answer, be that shove example grace in their face, shove grace. Exactly. You know, because this is, I mean, this, 
honestly, the more you grow in your faith with Christ, man, the more you realize, man, how much more you got to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Know? So here I am, you know, 13 years in, 12 years in, whatever. And, and I tell people all the time, I'm realizing how much I don't know. Mm. And I'm realizing how much I need to change. My blind spots are becoming more visible to me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I had a conversation with a friend about a month and a half ago. And I was actually – I was actually angry with him. I was oh, wow. mad at him because, you know, in my mind, in my expectations, in my mind, a friendship should look a certain way. Of course. You know, it just that's just the way. I, I mean, I'm geared that if I'm your friend, I am your friend. Mm-hmm. I am your friend. I'm going to be loyal to you. I'm going to help you in any way that I can. And I expect everybody else to kind of be like I am as a friend. Mm-hmm. And he just wasn't doing what I thought he should do. I got you. And I've actually texted him. I said, look, man, I'm in a bad place with our relationship right now. And I don't even know if I want to talk to you. Hmm. And he sent me a, 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 he sent me a, a verse and the verse said, if a, if a man sins against you, sit down and speak with him or something, you know, something around those lines. And I couldn't get past the first part of it. If, cause he yeah. had not sinned against me. Mm-hmm. He had not sinned against me. It was just he didn't meet my expectations that I had placed on him. Of course. Unfairly. And so we went and ate breakfast, and he sits down. He says, man, tell me what's wrong. I said, I'm wrong. Wow. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, I said, my wife has told me my whole time I've been with her for 25 plus, 35 years. Mm-hmm. I've been dating her for 10 and married to her for 25. She's told me. You have these extremely high expectations for people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the coach in me from coaching of football course, for so yeah. long. You know, it's just constant trying to get better and better and better. And she said, and you take those expectations and you project them on the people. And when they don't meet those expectations, you get let down. And then you turn around, you're mad because you think they're not doing what they ought to be doing when actually you're, you're it's, you know, they're just being who they are. Of course. And I looked at my boy, my brother, my brother in Christ. And I said, I said, you are just who you are. You don't act the way that I act. You don't mm-hmm. think the way that I think. You don't respond in relationships like I do. And I shouldn't expect you to do it the way that I do it. Yeah. And I said, so all I can tell you is I'm sorry. and But God has shown me a blind spot in my own life that I'm dealing with. And it just so happens that you were the one, when you sent that verse to me, that taught it to me. Yeah. You know, because you'd never sinned against me. And that, I mean, that woke me up. I'm like, wow. this is crazy. So, you know, when I think about relationships and, and you know, pointing out people's flaws and all that kind of stuff. I think to myself, you know, it's crazy how people will take certain pornography or Mm -hmm. homosexuality or these different things and they'll they'll pluck them out and they'll pretend like that one struggle is worse than all the rest of them that people are dealing with. Exactly. And I, and I'll tell people all the time, I have no, I have absolutely no negative feelings at all towards a person that chooses homosexuality, Mm -hmm. that chooses pornography, that chooses, infidelity yeah. i don't care what they choose i don't care what vice the enemy is using to try and drag them into the the pits of hell mm-hmm. i could care less about what it is i'm just telling you i know god's got a better plan exactly and i'm just going to try to get you on that plan so that you can have victory over these things that are creating these problems in your life that you don't even realize are creating problems in your life mm-hmm. so you know in the lines of what you what you're talking about is look if you're out there, man, and you're a believer and you're and you're like judging people and you're putting people down because of their sin, you're missing the whole point of, of grace and mercy. Yes. You're just yes. missing the whole thing. And so, I mean, wh- I mean, I, it brings me back to Jesus standing up for the woman. Yeah. I mean, the Pharisees, shouldn't this lady be punished? Shouldn't she? And he's over there drawing in the sand, not even paying any attention to them. <laughs> and then finally he gets up. He who was without sin cast the first stone. Every single one of them dropped their stone. You know, I think that the only one that could have thrown a stone didn't. Exactly. Exactly. He was perfect. And and that in itself was leading by example. And that I know that lady was left forever changed. And the same we can be that. You know, yeah. if that's happening in the workspace or if that's happening in the classroom where, you know, people are ganging up on because I mean Christian secular like we'll do it. We'll yeah. we'll gang up on somebody. But if somebody goes and says, Okay, wait. When's the last time you did this? When's the last time you lied? When's the last time you said a curse word? When's the last time you know you did this? Then it's a whole different conversation. Right. And so I think that's what we need to do. We need to you know pinpoint those moments and use them as teaching moments to say no 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 we're gonna love first, and then because we're showing them the love of God, they're going to want to change. They're going to want 
to do better. They're mm-hmm. going to notice that, okay, what I'm doing now isn't satisfying me. I want to try something else. And they'll come to us and say, what's the answer? What do I do? And that's when we get to You teach. know what's so beautiful about it, dude? This is to me. This is how, Okay, let's just say that I'm struggling with something. Mm-hmm. And you come to me in love. And you help me. Mm-hmm. And it gets better. That's what makes it so attractive. Yes. Because you're like, wait a minute. Samuel came to me. He pointed out something in my life that I needed to change. I'm changing it. God's helping me with his power and his grace and his mercy. He's helping me change my ways. And it's actually working out a lot better. Yes. I want to do that for somebody else. Exactly. That's how that works. Yep. It's just like a, it's just like, it, 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 I, I tell people, if, if I, if, if I was lost, mm-hmm. okay, and you knew me and you weren't and you didn't tell me, you could not tell me that you truly love me. Yep. If, if, if I was, I had a horrible marriage or a horrible relationship with whatever the case may be. And you didn't sit in and tell me about the victory in Christ. You don't care about me. Exactly. And and I care too much about the people around me, not to love them mm-hmm. to Christ, not to judge them, not to, you know, I did that when I was early as a Christian. Yes, that was, yes. You go through this cycle where you're like, you want to tell everybody what they're doing wrong, but then you get to a point where you're like, wait a minute. I've got a full-time job right here. Exactly. <laughs> yep. This is a full-time gig. Yep. I don't have time to be pointing everybody else's mess out. I'm too busy to deal with this mess. Exactly. And uh, But, man, I just um, – I love doing what – I mean, on a scale from 1 to 10, in my opinion, I got the best job in the world, That's man. That's what I'm saying. I mean, That's I'm like I'm a 12. I don't – I, I, I'm sorry if everybody, if, I'm sorry if you hate your job. I apologize if you hate right, your job. Right, right. I love my job. Exactly. I mean, I love my job, man. I love what I do. I love what God's called me to do. And I know you do too, man, because I can see it in the way that you act. Yes, sir. Because I, I get all the time, oh, are you going to get a real job? Are you going to get a real job? <laughs> that's the big, and I'm like, this is a job. Like, that's what people don't understand, you know. And, and I think that they don't understand the workload that goes into, you know, what we do. And not only on paper and and you know uh devices but in prayer and you know talking to god god what's next and getting a call at 3 a.m and it's one of the kids saying i'm about to cut myself and i need a conversation like it's those moments where i'm like like just like your doctor's on call we're on call as pastors at all time we don't get you know, even our rest days right. turn into work days sometimes yeah, because because somebody needs, you know, a hospital visit. Somebody needs, you know, just a conversation uh, or, you know, being the youth pastor, my favorite parents want me to, <laughs> hey, my parent or my kids acting up. I need you to talk to them. Right. Yeah, fixing. OK, I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to try my best. You know, <laughs> what are you teaching my kid? I'm trying to <laughs> teaching them, you know, Jesus. That's all I'm doing, you know. But, but yeah, so, you know, getting a real job, I, I, I tell everybody all the time, man, this is the best, you know, this is the best job. It, it really is. You know, I get to, to do, and I didn't want to wait till I was older because I'm able to minister to kids my age and say, listen, you know, what you're doing won't work because what I'm doing is working. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like I don't, like when I'm 25 or 26, I'm talking to a 18 year old, they can just say, oh, you're too old. You don't know what I'm talking about. I can literally tell these kids, I was you two years ago. I right. graduated high school two years ago. I know what the temptation's like. I know what it's like. Like, they can't tell me I'm, you know, outdated or anything like that. And so. Well, I, I, I got I to gotta bring this up, man. And I may be, you know, kind of sticking my nose where I don't, it don't belong. <laughs> but I saw you out to eat the other night. Yes. <laughs> so was there anything about that group of people that you're with that I need to know about? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, no, actually, no, actually. So there, um, you know, that was, a that was a, I've never actually went out to eat with, with her parents before. And, um, you know, I wanted to, to get to know them, get to, you know, cause I've, I've always heard about them and they've always, you know, we've always had conversations through her, but never with her. Um, but no, no, nothing like that. We're, um, cause I'm living with pastor Chris, you know, he, I'm still living with him, you know, and I'm, right. I'm paying rent for them. Cause they've actually, a lot of what I'm able to do here is because of them. Right. Um, I wouldn't be able to, you know, support myself if it wasn't for my mom and dad and pastor Chris and miss Linda, they've given me a home to call mine and anything I need. They're there. And so, you know, she stays on the weekends. Well, you know, everybody, makes that assumption because me and her spend so much time in ministry together right. that, you know, it's one of those things. 
But well, um, I absolutely adore her. Yes, and she's so awesome. Yeah. She she has come up beside me even on times where honestly I didn't deserve it, and she's been I'm here. What do you need from me? Yeah. And so she's she's been a rock. She's and, and multiple times though we've always reassured each other. They're we like we care about each other in a ministry aspect, but as far as relationally, um, just not there. Just not yeah. there. I I truly believe God has the one out there and waiting. Um, well, I say the one loosely because I, me and my youth pastor talked about this way back when we said, we don't really believe in, in that, that the perfect God, you know, of the universe has one, right. you know, because we, as we can choose multiple paths, you right. know, if, if we're, you know, if we're choosing sin and we're living a sinful life, why would God give us the woman of our dreams? You know, that, that if we are doing what we're supposed to, and we're living for God and we're doing, we're walking down our calling, why would he still bless us with that woman, you know, who's going to complete us and stuff. Um, but I do believe that there's one out there who is compatible with me and not only compatible, but I like to use the word competitive in a good way, not saying it has anything to do with pride or ego or anything like that. But I, I say it like this, when Mrs. Jeter comes in the picture, I want her to walk into a room and the kids no longer say, Pastor Samuel, Pastor Samuel, but run to her and say, you know, Pastor Jeter, Pastor Jeter, like whoever it is, you know, I want them to see her and to actually encourage me. Okay, I need to step up my game, you know, I need to, you know, and have this, you know, competitive, not her pulling me, not me pulling her because we'll get nowhere, but almost running our race together right. in the moment that one of us slips up, we look at the other and say, okay, I got to get better. You know, I got to get better. And we're constantly moving forward. That's my vision for, for what God has for me. And I don't think it's going to come anytime soon because for the longest time I said, I need a wife to do ministry. And I had this mindset because that's, and I'll be honest, I came from district events this past couple of weeks. I mean, we had three events in the past month, every single event, people came to me and said, you can't do ministry. You're not married. Yeah, you can't know. do ministry. You're not married. Well, Paul, Paul says it's better not to be married. Better not. And I tell our kids that all the time. I said, because a married man worries about the affairs of his wife, a That's single right. man worried about the affairs of God. And I said, right now I'm worried about the affairs of God. I'm not worried about the affairs of a woman. In fact, at this point in my life where I thought it was needed, I know now it's not that because I would just get distracted and, you know, and I, it's going to happen down the road. Um, but I'm at the point where I'm saying, God, your will be done. Well, I absolutely love her. Yes. And I could I can only say that I would be super excited if God did put y'all together. Yes, yes. <laughs> and honestly, and I will say her personality is very attractive. Um and, She is sweet, man. I God know. Please. She is. She is. And like I said, she's she's my biggest supporter. She's right there where I need her. I mean, she's the one that I'll take to um if I got to go pick up a girl, she, I said, Hey Megan, you know, I got to go pick up this girl, you know, okay, I'm on my way, you know, yeah. I, we'll meet up that. And so she's been that, you know, she's, she's allowed because our, our youth ministry is 70% girls and 30% boys. That's why a lot of people are like, you need a wife, <laughs> you know, you need a wife. <laughs> and that's where I reply and say, no, if I have the right help, I really don't. If I yeah. have the right people that are willing to stand alongside of me and say, okay, listen, we know you're young, we know you're single, but we're going to make this happen. We're going to allow you to be able to reach even the girls safely because we care about you and your ministry. Right. And so that's where she's really come along and made that happen. Well, man, I'm going to tell you, we talk about guardrails all the time. Yes. I, I don't do much counseling with single guys, but I do a lot of counseling with wedding uh, marriages. Mm -hmm. um, but we talk about guardrails when we talk about marriage and, you know, you just talked about one of the guardrails. You're never alone with a female. Exactly. And man, dude, I'm going to tell all you men out there, because according to our statistics, it's mostly men that listen to this podcast. Yeah. If you'll put a guardrail up in your life to never be alone with a female outside yes. of your wife, it will change your entire marriage. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it, it will it will keep you from getting yourself in a bad situation. Yes. I mean, and, and, you know, the guardrail is not down in the danger zone. It's way, way, way away from it. Yes. And so you say, well, that's kind of extreme. You never be. Look, man, um, if King David, King David in Scripture, God refers to him himself as, a man after God's own heart. Yep. He actually refers to David like that. Now, if King David, that is referred to as a man after God's own heart, can't withstand the temptation of messing around, mm -hmm. don't think you're going to be any, you know, any better at it. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Exactly. I, mean, I tell you know, I tell my kids that. I mean, don't, don't, don't fool yourself. Don't yep. think that you can overcome the temptation that literally billions of human beings have fallen to. Yes. And, yes. You know, and 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 I know sometimes people look at 
our faith and they're like, man, I don't understand why y'all talk about sin and pornography so bad and, you know, messing around with the people about being married is bad and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, you know, I just, it, it's a seed that when you sow it, yes, it's going to produce a harvest of negativity that's going to come along with it. And, and that's the part that I hate about it. It's not that I don't want somebody to have fun. It's not that I don't want somebody to enjoy their life. I just don't want to see them crash and burn. Yes. Because they think what they're doing is a good thing when it's actually a horrible thing. And I don't know if you ever use this 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 picture image, mm. but um, I'll tell people all the time, if, if me and you're sitting at a campfire mm. and it's cold outside and, and we got a nice fire burning and we're cooking some food on it and we got some light from it and it gives us some warmth and you know, it's awesome, man. It's like awesome. Ain't I mean, it like could it. not be more awesome. But if I grab a stick out of that fire and I throw it out in the middle of the woods and it sets the woods on fire, we're in trouble. Yeah. It's going to burn everything in its path to the ground and it's mm-hmm. not going to have any discrimination of what it burns down. Yeah. And I tell people that's how that's how intimacy is. That's how passion is. That's how sex is. It's it's great when you keep it in the confinement of where it's supposed to be, and that's a marriage. Yes. So when you take it outside of that marriage, it destroys everything in its path. And I'll tell you right now, if I had to put, if I had to put my finger on one thing that's burning this country to the ground, yes, it would be immorality. Yes. It would be a lack of people having moral standards when it comes to their intimate life. Yes. And. You know, you might say, well, man, you just don't want us to have fun. Look, I had as much fun as a guy can have when I was lost. (laughs) Okay, I know all about the fun. Okay, and let me assure you that what I was doing then compares not one inkling to what I'm doing now and how much I enjoy it. I was was just as passionate about being lost as I am about being found. Exactly. And so I can tell you that I can tell you that just this year, I'll share this story with you because you're a young man. I got you. So just this year, I was walking out of a restaurant, and I saw a young lady that I dated when I was in. Now, let me go back and think. I want to say I was in seventh grade. Okay. Okay, what was that, 12 years old? Yes. And I was being, I was sexually active with her. Mm-hmm. Okay. I saw her, and I said, and I'd been praying mm-hmm. about having an opportunity to see her. Wow. You know, because I couldn't, you know. I just wanted to, I wanted to um, ask for forgiveness. Of course. And so I sat down, I said, at the table, and her stepmom was sitting there with her. And I said, I, can I just sit down there for just a minute? And she's like, yeah. And she just kind of looked at me like, you know, I hadn't seen her in probably over a couple of years. Wow. And um, and I said, and she, and she just, tears started coming down her face. And I said, are you okay? She said, tell me you're not here to ask for forgiveness. I wow. said, that's exactly why I'm here. I said, I feel like God wants me to ask you to forgive me for hurting you when you were younger and just, you know, pushing you down that path of, of impurity and, and all the things that, that were involved in that. And I just want to ask you to please forgive me for being a, for having a part in all that. Yes. And she is literally just like in the middle of a restaurant, just wow. tears flowing. She said, since, since she said, since we have been, you know, apart all these years, all these years, since 40 years nearly. She said, I have consistently had dreams about me and you being in a relationship and you cheating on me and you leaving me. Wow. And it, and she said, it has just kept my heart broken for all this time. And she goes, and I, ser- I, I, I she said, I can't tell you how much I needed to hear you ask me that. Wow. And, and it just rocked me because I was That's like, crazy. I, you don't even realize that something you did 40 years ago mm-hmm. is still, you're still going to reap from that. That's true that you did back before you even knew Christ. It's true. And, and it was so amazing how it affected her because she just, she just looked at me and she was like, I cannot tell you how bad I needed to hear that come out of your mouth. Wow. And she goes, I I feel like I'm just completely free now. And I was like, you know, the sin that we, we, we think it's all right. We think it's not a big deal, but I promise you it's a big deal because when you look at pornography, the reality of it is, man, is you're looking at something, you're looking at a young lady that has a father that loves her and has a yes, brother and yes. has friends and has a spouse or has a boyfriend, you know, have people around her that love her and they don't want her living in this lifestyle. And most likely she's involved in drugs and there's a lot of other things that go yes. along with numbing the reality of having to live in that lifestyle. 
and the more you click on it, the more you support it. Yep. You know, and yep. I tell people, you know, they say, you know, what well, you don't drink and you no, I don't drink. I don't click on things. I don't drink. Why? Because I'm not going to sow the provision that God gives to me into yes. things that I know the enemy is using to destroy God's children. Exactly. I'm not judging nobody. I'm not telling you that your convictions got to be my convictions or my convictions got to be your convictions. I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to put a penny that God entrusted into my wallet mm-hmm. into an industry that the enemy is using to destroy God's children. Yep. I'm just not going to do it. Yep. I'm a warrior. Exactly. I'm a, I'm all in. Yes, yes. I'm all in on Team Jesus. You know what I'm saying? I'm not exactly. like I don't. I'm not putting my toe in the water. I'm jumping in head first. Let's go. Yes. Let's go. Let's charge hell with a water pistol. Yep. And let's knock this thing out. Yep. You know, and I know you feel the same way, man. And oh. that's the thing I love about you. I love watching your passion, dude. I, you know what they tell? I've heard a guy say one time, "You let a man burn for Christ, people will come to see it." Yep. Yep. You know. So before we get off the podcast today, man, I want you to share the story. I heard you share this story about when you were at school and you felt like God wanted you to preach in the, in the cafeteria. Yes. yes. <laughs> Will you share that? So uh, that so you know um, when you're you're freshly saved, you could conquer the world. Like I mean, you you're just like because you have something that you didn't have before, and you just want to run with it. You want to tell every single person you run into. Well, I had that same passion. I remember going up to uh, my youth pastor who actually, he was brand new. He just, I got the word from God to do it before he even came in. And so, you know, I was, it was a January, um, it was, I think it may have been the third or fourth. And so I, I hear from God so strongly that he wanted me to preach on picnic tables. He brought up a previous story I heard from pastor Ray talking about some hippie who used to talk about, you know, Jesus on a picnic table. He's like, no, nah, I think this guy was doing it, you know, mockingly. I don't think he was doing it for real, but God brought that to my mind and said, I want you to do this. And so I went to Pastor Marcus. I said, listen, Pastor Marcus, I want to do this. And he goes, when and where? I'm going to be there. We're going to make this happen. And because everybody told me, it's going to be a long time for you to be a, a youth pastor. It's going to be a long time for you to be a children's pastor. At this time, I'm, I'm 15. So I said, okay, if, if I don't have the title, I don't care. If I don't have a pulpit, I don't care. The congregation will be the students at the school. The pulpit's going to be that picnic table, and I'm going to preach the word. That was all I was caring about. I said, I don't need anything that, you know, Oh, you're not a pastor. That's okay. I'll preach the word. That's okay. You know that. And so, uh, it was January. It must've been the seventh or eighth. By the time that I preached on the picnic table, I promoted it on, you know, Instagram, everything. I said, Hey guys, I'm going to preach. And of course everybody was like, no way. What? (laughs) Because at this point I haven't really established myself as the Jesus loving kid yet. I was still freshly saved. I was still, um, there was a lot of people who were like, wait a minute, this kid used to bully me. This kid used to pick on me. This kid used to be this. And so it was 10th grade. I walk out there and I got up on the picnic table outside our uh, school at Santa Fe High School. And um, and it was cool because that table kind of became, you know, my table to preach on. You know, nobody would ever like go near it. They were like, oh, man, that's preacher's table. Um, and so I remember getting up on the table. I thought they were going to throw rocks at me. I thought <laughs> they were going to, th- you know, throw tomatoes at me. I don't know. That's just what I thought. And I came up with every excuse not to. I said, God, it's too it's too rainy outside. And there was no rain. <laughs> I said, God, there's not enough people. And there was like 300 kids in this courtyard. Finally, my youth pastor was like, listen, bro, I'm going to go Facebook Live if you're not on the table, it's going to be on Facebook and then everybody's going to you know, see that you didn't follow through. Well, I was like, well, that's not going to happen. Right. So I jumped on the table. I will tell you what the spirit took over. I couldn't even tell you what I said. I popped open the Bible. I preached from my favorite verse, which was uh, Jeremiah one five. Um, and it was just crazy because I'm reading, I'm shaking, you know, I'm, I'm so scared. And I look up and students are there. I mean, their jaws are to the floor and they're just receiving the word that God had for them. And I really thought that somebody was going to kick me off. In fact, one of our football coaches stood in front of the table when one of the faculty came. He said, no, 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 he can do this. And it was almost like God put a guardian angel there to kind of let me do what I felt God was calling me to do. From that moment on to 11th grade year and 12th grade year, the name Samuel didn't even exist anymore. People just called me preacher. You know, I remember some kids would, would be like, Hey preacher, you know, what's the word of the day? And I'd have to hurry up and have a verse for them. <laughs> um, you know, I remember kids coming into the bathroom, you know, crying and stuff. And I'd be like, yo, what's up? And then talk to them about the relationship issues and stuff. And, um, and you know, I got backlash of course, from, uh, different groups of kids who didn't believe in what I believed in. And, and 
all I said was, listen, I'm just going to love you regardless. You know, I don't, you know, I'm not against what, you know, uh, I'm not going to come against you with anything. I'm just going to preach what I believe. And if you can, if you want to receive it, go ahead. If not, just stay out of my way was yeah. kind of my mindset. I had teachers, one teacher closed my Bible in the middle of school and it broke my heart. But I will tell you, I let that happen. The next year, God turned that atheist from an atheist into a Christian believer who actually moved the following year to go help troubled kids Amen. at a Christian camp. I mean, literally did not have to say, oh, that's not right. You can't do this. I just said, yes, sir. I'll put it away. I put it away. And it was that example. And he showed me, he said, you know what? He goes, I had doubts, but because the love you showed me, even though I was so mean to you at times, really opened my eyes to give this God thing a try. And during the summer, he got saved. And so it's really cool. Even to this day, if I'm going to Alachua, I'll see kids. They'll be like, preacher, is that you? And I get to tell them. And, you know, all of them's like, you're still doing it? Like, I'm like, <laughs> I'm still doing it. You know, I, I went from preacher to pastor. But, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm still – and I, I love it because I, you know, and I was really hoping I'd get somebody that could come behind me and kind of take over. But the, the, the sad part is we are losing my generation of kids. Even my mom was, you know, telling me uh, – man, I wish there was more kids your age you could hang out with because all you do is spend time around, you know, the teenagers and middle yeah. schoolers. And I'm like, well, mom, I said, one, I'm never going to complain about that because, you know, I'm making an invest in, or investment in the kingdom and God's right. going to give me what I need. You know, I can go into sermons and, and get fed. You know, I can look on YouTube, find these preachers. To, so that's not what I'm worried about. But I said, mom, it's just hard finding another person my age that is passionate about Jesus. Right. You know, you could go to the biggest church and their young adults ministry is probably going to be the smallest thing in the church because it's just such an unreached people group in our, you know, in our society because it is easier to do anything else. But I have, you know, I have this, this passion. I have a dream that I'll slowly but surely change that, you know, I'll slowly but surely stand as a witness to kids my age. And, you know, I get some of the older siblings of our kids, uh, they'll be like, wait, I thought you said your siblings, you know, youth pastor was, you know, was a youth pastor. And they're like, this is a kid. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> I'm like, I'm 21. Okay. I'm not a kid, but, um, you know, but I, and already they're like, whoa, that's really cool. I didn't know you could do that that young. And that's almost always, and I get to say, you know, like, listen, you can love Jesus now. Like this isn't a decision you have. I feel like some people put it, oh, I want to go through my party days. I can testify. I've never done drugs. I never drank and I've never had sex before marriage. I, and standing not to ever pat myself on the back. I know that's only God. You know, I tell the students, I could be in the worst place ever right now if, if not for God. Um, but I stand to say, you know what? I'm, I'm a witness to say Jesus can do it. Jesus will do it. And in our generation, I think that's so so needed. Oh, it is, man. I mean, when you start thinking about, um, you know, just that whole – it's just crazy because I'm from the total opposite end of the spectrum. Like – I mean, for, until I turned 37 years old, I was living in complete and total rebellion and sin. And um, just to think about, and I'm telling you, man, I'm 50 now. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I sit here sometimes, man, and I think to myself, dude, what I if? wished I wouldn't have wasted yeah. all that time. I wish somebody would have, yeah, I'm sure they were, I'm sure people were trying to reach me back then. Of course. But, you know, God's got his reason for Perfect all way, the way yep. things work out. Yep. But, man, you know, being over halfway through your life, and knowing there's so much more that needs to get done. And yes, it's, it's hard sometimes, man, but that's why I stay fervent. That's why I stay passionate. That's yes. why I stay focused. That's why stay I stay excited yep. because, you know, and I don't, I don't ever see a day of retirement. I just don't see that in my, of course, yeah. you know, I mean, this is, this is something not, that God will give me the ability to do for the rest of my life. So, yes, sir. you know, but man, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you coming, man. Yes, I sir, hope, I hope God gives you the green light to get involved with FCA and the schools and, I hope that's something that you want to do, man. And I know that, um, I know without a doubt, man, that you would be absolutely perfect at it. And so, man, um, I just want to tell you, thank you. Yes, sir. Of course. Thank you, thank for, you for having, you know, thank you for thanking of me. I yeah, mean, man. this is an amazing opportunity. Anytime that I could tell my story, I definitely, I definitely appreciate it. Yeah. So if you're out there, man, if you're 50, God will use you. Yes. If you're 21, 15, God will use you. Come on. And um, and trust me, man, this world, they desperately need the grace and the mercy and the yes. gospel of Jesus Christ, man. That's the answer to our problems, not not any election, not nope. any – that's not the answer. Nope. And, um, you know, it's like I, I told the guys when I preached to the football team this year, they were – some of them kneeling during the national anthem, and I said, I see your heart. Yes. I, I know you're hurting. I understand. I get it. 
I said, but let me go ahead and share something with all of you guys sitting in this room right now. And there's about 100 football players in there. I said, hate's not going nowhere. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, people hate me because I'm a preacher. There are people that hate me because I'm white. There are people that hate me because I'm married to a beautiful woman. There's people that hate me for whatever reason. There's pe- People are going to find a reason to hate. Yep. And if they hate you because of the color of your skin, that's not going away, man. Yep. As much as we want to legislate it, and I got it. I understand that. But re- the reality is the only thing that makes people stop hating is the grace of Jesus. That's it. Yes, There's yes. nothing that makes people change their heart until they meet the King of Kings. And so, man, I want to thank you for preaching the gospel. Thank you for yes, staying sir. faithful. Yes, sir. And um, cannot wait to see what God does with you, man. I'm, I'm excited. I'm watching. I'm so excited. I'm watching. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I'm, I, I you, appreciate that. If you print some shirts up, I'm buying one. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you what. I, I tell everyone all the time. I said, you know, my students are my biggest fans. And I could have just them. I'd be set. You yeah. Know, they're, they, they're in my corner cheering me when I definitely need it the most. So, But I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And before we get off the podcast, man, I just want to say one more thing. I know there's probably people out here listening right now that's had a loved one that have served in the military and and gave their life for our freedom. And I want to tell you right now, I appreciate that, man. I do. I appreciate the sacrifice that people make so that we can be free. And I don't take it for granted. And you'll never see me kneel during the national anthem. I don't care what I'm protesting. It doesn't make any difference because I'll never want to put any negative light on the sacrifice that people have made so that I can be able to be free and preach the gospel of Jesus. Amen. Only a couple of people are willing to die for me. That's a first responder. That's a soldier. And that's Jesus. And I'll always show honor and respect to all of them, no matter what. So, um, thank you guys for watching a, a voice in the wilderness podcast. Please click share, click like, yes. Let everybody know, man, let somebody hear the gospel, encourage somebody with this message. And thank you so much for listening. We love you guys. And we'll see you next week. Thank you.